Uh, so, today, as you probably, hopefully, have already seen, is probably more interesting to you if you are subscribing to this sort of content. I went over the different roles of aircraft, that's helicopters and fixed-wing aircraft. I think it's important to go over the role of ships because while people uh, perhaps look at aircraft and they see aircraft as something that is incredibly sort of well categorised, you have something like the F-35, which is a clear strike fighter. It has two clear roles. You look at something like uh, the Typhoon, which clearly has interception capabilities. You look at something like the F-22 Raptor, which is clearly designed for air dominance. For ships, it's not often that simple. And we have screaming children outside for some reason, behaving badly. Anyway, the reason it's not so simple, particularly in the modern age, what we see is the increased integration of technology within specific types of ships. So if I were to ask you a hundred years ago, or perhaps 70 years ago, what's the difference between a frigate and a destroyer? You would be able to tell me nearly exactly, because they had very different specific roles uh, and didn't have too many of the same capabilities. The destroyer was, you know, designed for destroying uh, torpedo boats, and that was its specialised role. And the frigate, designed for auxiliary support and sort of accompaniment for larger ships. So, fundamentally, what we've got to look at is future technologies being implemented as well, as we see configuration come in, but also the similarities between uh, ships. So, as I've said, easily identifiable 100 years ago, but nowadays the Type 45 uh, destroyer, let's say, and the Type 26 frigate, I get that that is a rather high-end frigate, but they have reasonably similar capabilities. They both have land strike capability, they both have uh, anti-air capabilities, they both have some sort of, you know, in land strike, either gun or cruise missile capabilities. They have surface warfare capabilities via the utilization of naval cruise missiles. Both have torpedoes, um, or the Type 31 can certainly be configured to operate in multiple areas. They can both hunt submarines reasonably well. And I think that's really the crux of the issue, is that not only is everything so versatile nowadays, or perhaps not an issue, but confusion. Not only is everything so versatile nowadays, but uh, there are technologies being integrated that mean ships can be configurable, they can be changed, and that really means we have to have clearer definitions than ever. So I think it's just worth doing this overview. Anyway, I will actually get to the point now, because I've done the boring stuff. So, if we look at what is the most notable, the most recognisable ships. We see aircraft carriers. You can't look at an aircraft carrier and not be able to label it as such. Aircraft carrier's roles are, you know, obvious for obvious reasons. It's designed to carry aircraft and it's meant to be able to launch those aircraft, uh, recover the aircraft and has the facilities in order to arm them. Uh, repair them, ensure that they are well maintained. And these aircraft in turn are designed to aid strikes, land strikes, and also perhaps accompany air defense capability. The reason uh, aircraft carriers were invented was because it's effectively a moving air base. If you look around the world, particularly if you have an enemy, if you wanted to launch aircraft at them, and to an extent now, if you wanted to launch aircraft at them, you don't necessarily have the range uh, of something like a ship. You might not be able to get so close to them, and if they are hostile, you're not going to have, be able to have an airbase near enough to them to launch planes that they're not either going to destroy or get rid of through some legislative process uh, politically. They're not going to allow it, is my point. So if you have a mobile air, uh, aircraft carrier, a mobile aircraft base, it means that one can operate pretty much anywhere in the world. One can project one's naval and air power 
into the rest of the world, and that's accompanied by a large uh, carrier strike group. So it's a synergy of forces. So that's a very positive thing. Uh, the aircraft it houses generally are strike fighters. They are other fighter aircraft, perhaps for air superiority, or their helicopters, and increasingly UASs, that's unmanned aerial systems, so drones, as you'll probably know them. And in exceptional circumstances, some of them have the capability to launch larger aircraft, bombers, attack aircraft, although generally you can't recover them once landing. But the ones you can recover, the idea is they have massive uh, range because they can travel wherever the aircraft carrier travels, which is incredibly important, and it means that naval aircraft don't have to have such massive range, they have to have ample range, but they only have to have uh, certain range capabilities. They don't have to have huge, huge fuel tanks, meaning they can leave space for other systems, which make aircraft perhaps superior. Um, now, if we're looking at an aircraft carrier, the way you literally designated, designate it is it can carry aircraft. It has both storage space and it has a runway, generally although we'll see how that sort of pans out in the future, for taking off aircraft. What this doesn't include is something like a helicopter landing pad. It's got to have major facilities for the launch of fixed-wing aircraft, as well as maybe rotary-wing aircraft. Um, the next most distinctive categorization is a submarine. Submarines do what they say, uh, say on the tin as well. They are submarine. They are below the water. Submarines generally fall into two roles. You either have attack submarines or ballistic missile submarines. Both designs rely upon stealth, and submarine designs as a whole rely upon stealth. They remain below the surface of the water, undetected, uh, in order to have largely surprise advantage, but also so they can carry out whatever capabilities they need to carry out or whatever function they need to carry out that may be mission-specific, without necessarily the need for escort. They don't need anything to protect them, and they can operate alone because that maximizes stealth. And that's an incredibly positive thing, because if something cannot be seen, if it's stealthy, if it's under the surface, that can wreak havoc on blue water fleets. And that is what uh, attack submarines are designed to do. Originally, they are designed to destroy uh, blue water ships, which are obviously incredibly expensive, uh, huge mega structures that require a lot of investment, and so if you can take those out while being in the area without being detected, then that's an incredibly positive thing. So originally this meant they carried torpedoes only. Nowadays they obviously also carry torpedoes, but they're also designed for, uh, as we saw, sort of emerging at the end of World War II, they are designed for underwater combat as well, submarine combat. They are designed to destroy other submarines with torpedoes themselves. They often carry cruise missiles for some land strike capability, but also naval strike, so they may emerge to the surface uh, if it's strategically convenient to do so, if they don't need the stealth, and launch naval cruise missiles uh, for anti-ship missions. Ballistic missiles, on the other hand, don't engage in the battle. They're basing, basically moving nuclear deterrence. They ensure that a country is fully capable of a nuclear strike or counter-strike. They are not really designed to be in-use weapons. It means that in the West, a firm is trident capable. And the idea of the submarine is again to remain as stealthy as possible in order that it can maintain the capability of being nuclear capable were the actual country or launch bases to be hit for as long as humanly possible. Uh, this is the bit of the video that I think is probably more interesting than nuanced uh, warships. So we'll go over sort of the older technology, which is cruisers. Cruisers aren't so much in use anymore. When you think of something like Dreadnought, this huge battleship, large, armoured, uh, bulking warship, utilising large calibre guns, there aren't so many that are built by actual design anymore, because you've had the merging and integration of technologies, and they're not too versatile, really. Nearly all modern warships obviously still use armour, and 
the idea of this large battleship, this battle cruiser, is still ingrained within the culture of naval warfare. But while we still use large caliber naval guns um, for land strikes, they tend not to be so much used in surface warfare. They may be used, but they're used in a far smaller way. You don't have these huge hulking ships which are designed purely to launch as many projectiles as humanly possible at the enemy and to destroy surface fleets because that's not the way that surface warfare is waged anymore. It's far more efficient, far more quick uh, and far more effective to use naval cruise missiles, often to use torpedoes, that sort of thing. Anyway, if we look at cruisers, cruisers really go into four categories. You've got these huge battle cruisers, which are, you know, the enormous bulking battleships you think of. But then there are also uh, large cruisers, heavy cruisers, medium cruisers, and light cruisers. I won't go into it too much, but a large cruiser is designed to act as a cruiser does, but with sort of maximum speed and power. It's designed to be perhaps auxiliary, but... The idea is that it can really push into uh, enemy waters. It can operate with decent maneuverability for a ship of its size. Large cruisers sit somewhere in between these massive battle cruisers and heavy cruisers, which are more maneuverable, more fast, um, and so it's a bit slower, but heavier as well, despite the fact that it's a large cruiser rather than a heavy cruiser. Anyway, they still maintain strong firepower. That is largely the point of a cruiser. They have strong firepower and a lot of gun capability. What we saw later in the uh, 20th century was smaller models becoming more focused upon stuff like self-sufficiency, being able to operate alone rather than in a strike group, which can be beneficial for certain functions, taking out certain targets. And nowadays, really, we have more if cruisers are going to be implemented they're missile cruisers they utilize cruise missile technology for naval and land strikes and that is what to an extent has replaced the gun is missile capability but i don't think that's really the important bit we're on to the confusing bit now destroyers uh, destroyers are since the beginning of their inception escort ships they are designed to escort larger ships merchant or military and they utilize speed and endurance. They are meant to stick with whatever it is throughout the entire journey and keep up a solid uh, protection envelope the entire time. Originally, they were called torpedo boat destroyers, but the modern destroyers focus more on stopping closing threats. Uh, aircraft, submarines, maximized sort of anti-ship capability for their function. They focus on stopping clo sort of closing threats and that is largely what they do. They are more defensive, um, I guess, accompanying ships, complementary ships that are designed to protect the real assets. Now, that does not mean that they don't have their own armaments that are incredibly potent. So they've got, you know, as I've said, anti-ship capability. They can take out submarines and aircraft, but they also generally utilize uh, land cruise missiles, torpedoes for blue water uh, vessels and ground have pretty effective defensive systems on all sides so destroyers do have this excellent strike capability and apologies that's a helicopter and often feature uh, larger guns of their own they have large and small caliber guns and are generally trying to be operated with minimal crew frigates on the other hand originally they are also sort of designed to help ships in transit. They are auxiliary ships. They take on this auxiliary role, but it includes land strike, fundamentally. It's meant to be a complementary, um, perhaps not complementary, a similar role on a smaller scale to some of these larger ships, uh, to perhaps a cruiser. But its role is specialised in anti-submarine uh, warfare and air defense. So their use obviously is far more varied nowadays. They're used a lot for sort of pirate hunting. They're used for stopping drug smugglers. 
that sort of thing in a non-military sense, but for naval warfare, their role is very similar to the destroyer in that they can uh, accompany ships and effectively take on this auxiliary role, capable of land strike and defence, and that works very well. The only difference, of course, being that uh, frigates are generally more manoeuvrable. They don't have so many. It's not quite as bulky, but that is at the cost, often, uh, of armament uh, and perhaps general weapon systems and propulsion systems and torpedo capacity and the ability to take hits. So there are benefits and drags to each ship. For other, and I would sort of probably put it in this other category, ships, there's what I'd say is probably pretty underappreciated, the literal combat ship. Basically, it's a super adaptable ship, uh, like the Type 31 frigate. It can hunt down smaller threats, and when I say smaller threats, I don't mean uh, submarine hunting. I don't mean trying to shoot down helicopters or UA UAVs, UASs. The idea is that it can shoot down unmanned boats, uh, provide ISR, take out perhaps small vehicles that are traveling around. Uh, traversing in green water and sometimes even brown water spaces, but their real role, or their, the mo role they've been mostly used for, because that sort of technology isn't often employed, is laying mines, engaging in mine hunting, uh, and generally ISR, so intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance. Often these are under underappreciated because they aren't included in strike groups often. They are at the leaving point and they are at the arrival point and they are if you were to imagine the coast guard as a sort of uh, naval branch the idea is that they remain close-ish to the coastline and can carry out capabilities uh, that perhaps bulkier ships couldn't uh, less maneuverable ships couldn't and then of course there's amphibious assault ships which are effectively trying to deploy ground forces uh, or collect ground forces. Uh, so it can go vice versa, but generally it is the deployment of ground forces. They can carry out some land strike, they have air defense, uh, and they are generally well protected because obviously they want to keep anyone who's uh, transitioning to land safe. And so they often carry a lot of equipment, the sort of stuff that might, me might be needed for uh, incursion into this land that they're going into, or at least the establishment of coastal bases, the establishment of coastal areas, and the maintenance of a strong position. They may use helicopters, which could be utilised for both transport, uh, or they might be utilised for actually going and sort of scouting, looking at the immediate area, and they're effectively designed to be this, I guess, the bridge in the gap between the ground forces that are already inland, these littoral ships which have the capability to go in green and brown waters, uh, and a frigate effectively, because they do have some capabilities in order to clear the area that they need to attack. So what we can see is the new Type 31 frigate has amphibious warfare capability, which is rather essential in some circumstances, because actually when one is conducting amphibious warfare, the incursions need to be uh, swift and one needs to have a lot of amphibious capable vehicles, or ships in this case. If we're looking at anything else, it's put in the other category, really, uh, or at least the Royal Navy puts it there, but it's tankers, it's transport ships, it's perhaps even merchant vessels that accompany. And these shouldn't be understated or underappreciated because they are what keep the rest functioning and they deliver supplies to certain maritime areas they deliver supplies to naval bases to ports and they effectively keep the machine functioning as best as possible now of course because these keep the machine functioning the naval machine they're incredibly valuable assets to have but they're also incredibly uh, significant targets for the enemy to strike and so Again, you'll have to excuse me because I really don't know too much about the Navy. And so, 
often they are accompanied by support. So often that's frigates uh, and generally more attempting to merely accomplish their mission goal, which is to get from point A to point B and restock, uh, resupply, extract, that sort of thing. So they're the backbone of which the rest can derive its power. So I think I'll leave it there because my brain is rather fried today, as you may be able to tell. Uh, rather tired. There was a large thunderstorm last night. Anyway, I hope that sort of helps and, you know, I'm still a little bit confused on the matter, but I hope that helps to sort of mull over the idea of differences between destroyers and frigates uh, and the categorizations that we see otherwise, the roles that are uh, more specific, more clear ships would provide. So I think I'll leave it there or else I'll just confuse people more.